Good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the next instalment of the IOP West Midlands Keel Physics Centre Lecture Series. So um, welcome to all our usual uh, attendees um, this evening. For those that haven't joined before, I'm just going to spend a few moments going through some of our usual standard practice so you know what expect, uh, to expect this evening, and then we will hand over to tonight's speaker. So firstly, thank you to everybody for joining us. Um, we know that there are all sorts of people from all over the world joining us tonight. So thank you if it's very early where you are or very late. Thank you for joining us here on what is actually a very warm um, North Midlands evening. So for those that haven't joined us before, our talks are 60 minutes long. Um, we will have a short break of around five minutes, about halfway through. And as you'll see in a moment, that is because we are joined by Stephen, who's our British Sign Language interpreter. And that allows Stephen to have a break, as well as for the rest of us uh, to fill our mugs or glasses this evening. Uh, we are also uh, we're going to run a question and answer session towards the end of the talk. So if you do have any questions throughout the presentation, please pop them in the chat uh, and I'll make sure I collate those and ask them of our speaker at the end of tonight's talk. Uh, on that note, if you could keep your mics and your cameras turned off during the talk, that will certainly help those of us that are on a very limited bandwidth. Um, as I mentioned right at the start, this is our penultimate talk within our talk series. Uh, I will give you details of our final talk, which is taking place in about two and a half weeks time at the end of tonight's talk. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to introduce you to tonight's speaker. Uh, and she is uh, Sophie Allen from the National Space Academy. Uh, and Sophie is the head of teaching there at the NSA. Uh, and in addition to teaching physics and astronomy on the pioneering, uh, pioneering space engineering course, Sophie has spent the last 10 plus years delivering lectures and workshops to students and teachers across the globe. Uh, outside of her teaching duties, Sophie has led on the development of space education programmes on a national and international scale for organisations such as the European Space Agency, uh, the STFC and Association for Science and Discovery Centres, uh, and bringing her expertise to millions of school children and families across Europe. She has developed activities for the missions of astronauts Tim Peake and Thomas Beskett uh, and the Rosetta uh, Gaia James Webb Space Telescopes and Mars InSight missions, working closely with project scientists and engineers for all three of those missions. Uh, so with no further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Sophie. I know we're in for a fabulous talk this evening. If you aren't aware, uh, the subject of tonight's, tonight's talk is the James Webb Teles Space Telescope. Uh, so over to you, Sophie, to, to give us a lovely uh, talk. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Scott. So uh, good evening, everybody. There's a phone going off. There we go. <laughs> Don't know what that was. Um, Yes, good evening everyone. Um, as Scott said in his introduction, my name is Sophie and I work for an organisation called the National Space Academy. And I'm just going to share my slide now and take you through my talk tonight, which is going to be on something that has been a little bit of an obsession for me over the last 10 or so uh, professional years. And that is the James Webb Space Telescope. So I'm just going to share my slides and start the presentation. Okay, so uh, I thought I'd start with just a very brief introduction to myself and to the organisation that I work for. So I started out in astrophysics, that's what my degree was in, and I did a, a little bit of research then. And I realised while I was doing that, that actually one of my main passions was teaching and talking about the science. I very much like to, to know the kind of big picture thing rather than necessarily getting too ingrained in uh, individual nitty gritty things. So I decided that education was the way to go. I trained as a physics teacher and worked for a few years in uh, Leicester City Schools. And then I got incredibly lucky because the National Space Academy was founded in 2008 at the National Space Centre in Leicester. And uh, they were looking for a astrophysics specialist teacher and I managed to go and work for them. And I've been with them ever since. So the National Space Academy itself is a educational charity that has been set up primarily with support from the UK Space Agency. And our aim overall is to try and get more people, specifically young people, coming out of school with the skills and the knowledge of the space sector necessary to be able to enter it and work in the sector. And even if they're not going to go off and work in space science, it's really important to us that people are space literate, that people have a good understanding and a good connection with what's going on in the world of space research. 
So to do this, we have a network of 35 outstanding lead educators. These are current classroom teachers who we train up and introduce them to our project scientists. We give them activities and we get them to deliver activities that are across the STEM, so across science, technology, engineering and maths, uh, but allow us to support curriculum learning through a space context and a space storyline. And a lot of people don't realise that the UK has got a thriving space industry. It's been growing year on year and at the moment there are 45,000 people directly employed within the UK space industry. So it's something we're not very good at shouting about but we're trying to make sure that we're helping as many good quality scientists, engineers, computer programmers and other professions come through with a good baseline space knowledge. And as part of this, I have been developing activities for working with scientists and engineers who are working on the project and training people up on the James Webb Space Telescope, basically since I started in 2008. In order to do this, we have got five project scientists and engineers who we work with. They give us information about what they're doing. They train us up on the science and the engineering behind current space missions, allowing us to embed this in the activities that we're doing. We then take this out to students in the form of student masterclasses. We do teacher training. We run careers events where students get the opportunity to come along and speak or see online to a range of space professionals. Uh, and then we also do a lot of space education and public engagement developments. Got mentioned some of what I've been working on. Um, we've developed programs for the European Space Agency, UK Space Agency. Um, STFC is where my main involvement with the Webb Telescope has come in. And also I've been lucky enough to design some experiments or be a part of the team that designed the experiments that went up with Tim Peake to the International Space Station to be done there as part of his uh, Principia mission. So my job is quite varied. I still do a lot of teaching on our space engineering course. This is a course that we run with Loughborough College. Uh, I teach A-level physics and astronomy and our students also do maths and a BTEC in engineering. Uh, and I get to spend the rest of my time talking to engineers and scientists and finding out all the really interesting good science that's relevant to students that we can put into our programmes. I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky, I do uh, enjoy my job a lot. So before I get into my presentation proper on the Webb Telescope, it is important to point out that while I've been working in the educational environment of the Webb Telescope, while I have a uh, fairly good working knowledge of the, particularly the astronomy of Webb, I'm not an expert in any one particular area. I've got a pretty good overall look and that's what I'm going to be sharing with you today. In this uh, presentation, we're going to be looking at what the Webb Telescope is, what it's going to be doing, where it's doing that from, and why it's important. So the Webb Telescope is an ESA, European Space Agency, NASA collaboration. And it came about when astronomers started to realise that the Hubble Space Telescope would eventually come to the end of its life. Now, the Hubble has been phenomenally successful, launched in 1990, fully operational since 1993. It has revolutionised our understanding of the universe. It's still functional now, but it's no longer going to be maintained and upkept. And so early on, it became clear that we were going to need a new space telescope that was going to look for other things, that was going to work in different ways. There's no point in when you're, you're designing something that's going into space in just putting the same thing up again and again. We've got new questions, we've got more information, and so we've got a new set of parameters for what we want our telescopes to do. So the Webb Telescope was born out of that need. And in 1996, it was uh, announced originally as the next generation telescope. Now initially the Webb telescope had a launch date scheduled or planned for 2007. Obviously that didn't happen and there's a, a variety of reasons behind that. Space missions inevitably tend to take longer to get off the ground if you'll forgive the pun than you initially anticipate. There were issues with launching platforms, the project nearly got cancelled at one point and so it's been exciting but frustrating for me because 
I've been talking about, learning about and sharing, you know, a knowledge of the Space Telescope since 2008. And every time it's been, oh, it'll launch in 2011. It will launch in 2013. And it, uh, this has been a very tense year in terms of waiting and hoping that that launch would go ahead. It's not cheap. The expected total cost of the Webb telescope is that it will come in at about $8.8 .8 billion. That's including uh, design, implementation, construction, testing, launch, and all of the costs for the people that will be involved in the upkeep and the maintenance of the telescope in terms of analyzing the data, sending it commands and things like that. And it's got an expected potential operational lifespan of about 20 years. And um, this is actually much higher than we initially expected. We hoped that 10 years would be a good operational lifespan, uh, but it will all depend on how efficiently and how effectively we were able to launch it and get it onto its path to its halo orbit, which I'll talk a little bit about later on. Everything about that went perfectly and so potentially we might get 20 years of groundbreaking astronomy out of this telescope. So I mentioned that it was the successor to the Hubble Space Telescope. Now the Hubble Space Telescope has been revolutionary but it was predominantly or is predominantly a visible telescope. It has some near-infrared capabilities but it's very much designed to look at the visible spectrum of light and it gives us as a result those amazing pretty images. Now the Webb telescope is an entirely different beast. It's big. To give you an idea of how big it is I've got up on the screen here the dimensions of a tennis court and if you were to superimpose Webb on top of that it would fit quite nicely onto that tennis court. It's made up of 18 hexagonal individual mirror segments that will uh, that, uh, build together to make the primary mirror, the main light gathering surface. And here you can see one of the technicians working on six of those segments. So you really start to get an idea of just how big this beast is. And here you can see a scale model with some of the early original team. This was taken out at uh, NASA Goddard, I believe. So it's a beast. And it's so big that actually we didn't have a launcher big enough for it. It was too big to be able to launch on the Ariane 5 rocket. So the engineers had to get very creative. They basically had to develop the ultimate piece of space origami. I've got a little video here that shows the deployment sequence of the Webb telescope. So it launched folded up like this, everything, the sun shield, the antenna, the teles the actual mirror itself, all had to be folded into a compact space. Initially, the sun shield deployed, and that was the most important part of this. It was key that the sun shield would deploy, that would shade the side of the telescope that has all of the instruments on so that it can start that process of cooling down that we'll look at in a little bit. The sun shield is made up of five layers of multi-layer insulation. They're very reflective and the idea is that we're trying to stop as much of that infrared, that heat from the sun, penetrating through the shield to the telescope itself. Now this process had 344 possible single point failures. A single point failure is if something goes wrong, then that's the mission scrubbed. 80% of these single point failures were in this deployment sequence. 144 separate release mechanisms had to be deployed for this to happen. And this didn't happen quickly. It was conducted over a series of days to make sure that after each stage we could analyze, has everything worked? Do we need to send new commands? Is it broken? We'll see a bit later on why, but the problem with the Webb telescope is, unlike Hubble, if it breaks, we cannot get there to fix it. So part of the reason why its launch was delayed and why it didn't launch in 2007, as in the early days it was planned, was every step of the way, 
we had to test, test, test every one of these 144 release mechanisms. They were tested to destruction. They were tested in space simulated environments to make sure that the Webb telescope was going to deploy safely and effectively. Once it had launched from the Earth, it went onto a trajectory that you can see in this image here. And this gives you an idea of the time scale we were dealing with. So the Sun Shield was deployed 2.7 days after launch, or at least that was begun. 5.5 days after we had the full deployment. And then as we start to get towards this point called the L2 point, we started to deploy the antenna, the wings, uh, the primary mirror segments and the secondary mirror segments. And then after about 14 days, it was inserted into what we call a halo orbit. So an orbit that uh, is moving around this point in space called the L2. So why is the Webb telescope so big? Well, in this image, you can see the comparison between the primary mirrors of Hubble and Webb. Webb's primary mirror is six and a half meters across, much, much larger than Hubble's. And there's two reasons for that. You can think about the primary mirror as basically being a light bucket, a collection for all the light that you're getting from your distant stars, galaxies and objects in the universe. And the bigger that your dish is or your mirror is, the more light you are getting. Each photon, each little packet of light energy is giving you information. So we want to make our telescopes as big as they can be anyway. But there's an additional challenge with the Webb telescope. And that is that it is an infrared telescope. So unlike Hubble, which was primarily using visible light, the Webb telescope is going to be imaging our universe in the near and the mid regions of the infrared spectrum. Now, there's a relationship between the wavelength of light and the size that your telescope needs to be. Infrared has got a longer wavelength than visible light. And the problem is, if you're using a telescope, you are basically passing light through an aperture, through a gap. And when you do that, you get this thing called diffraction, the bending of light around an object or as it passes through a gap. Now, with telescopes, that diffraction can be problematic. And we have to think about it in terms of what we call resolution or resolving. So a resolution angle is basically just telling me what's the smallest angle from my telescope that I can get two individual objects in space being and still see them as distinct objects. You can see in this picture here that if they're too close together for your telescope, the diffraction patterns, the interference patterns from, those, um, from the telescope causes them to overlap with each other. And this means that we see it as a blurry mess rather than two distinct images. In order to resolve, we have to fulfill something called the Rayleigh criterion. And there's a useful mathematical formula. I make my students derive it. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you guys do that. Uh, but there's a useful mathematical formula that allows us to work out how big a telescope needs to be to work at a particular wavelength. And as you can see from the formula, this lambda here is the wavelength on top. We've got a constant of 1.22. And the B on the bottom is basically the size of the aperture or the size of our light collection source. So for infrared, because my wavelength is longer, I need a physically larger telescope in order to be able to keep that angle small, to keep a nice narrow possible separation between my two objects. So this means that we get a beautiful beast of a space telescope. Now, the mirror itself is, I, I'm not overstating it here at all, a genuine engineering marvel, marvel even. It's made of 18 beryllium gold plated hexagonal mirror segments. They're hexagons because they pack together nicely and we can easily tessellate them to be able to get a roughly circular shape for our telescope. They're made of beryllium because beryllium is incredibly light and incredibly strong. The problem with mirrors is the bigger you make them, the heavier they are, and they're not only more expensive to launch, but they start to buckle under their own weight. And then these beryllium hexagons are coated in gold. Gold is the best material or one of the best materials for reflecting infrared light. And so as a result, with a good deployment, we could get a perfect infrared reflecting mirror for our telescope. 
but the deployment is difficult. We need our mirror to be perfectly aligned. And the tolerance in, in this is absolutely tiny. So on the back of each of these mirrors, you can see in the image here, you have a setup of six actuators. Now these actuators uh, allow absolutely tiny, fine movement in our mirror. And the tolerance in these actuators, we can line the mirror up and all the different segments up to within one ten thousandth the thickness of a human hair. And this had to be done over a long time. We had a long calibration period. As the telescope cools down, as it gets further away from the sun, from the earth, as it starts to radiate all of that heat into space, you get contraction in the materials. They start to warp. And so as it was journeying to its L2 point, we had to constantly make microscopic little variations in the alignment of each one of those 18 mirror segments. Here's a little selfie that was taken shortly after the mirrors were deployed. Uh, I love space selfies. There's a brilliant Rosetta space selfie as well. I think they're excellent ways of starting to uh, connect with the mirrors. And this was the first image that was sent back from the Webb telescope. Now, A, the images we get from Webb are never going to be as pretty as the Hubble images are. And B, believe it or not, what we're seeing there is one galaxy. But we're seeing one galaxy as it was being reflected and focused back in different parts of the detector by those 18 different hexagonal structures. So using this image as a guide and constantly taking that image, the Webb telescope was able to make tiny incremental changes in each one of the mirrors until eventually we were able to have one single point one single image of that distant galaxy. And it's absolutely phenomenal how well this has worked. So the mirror is now functional. We are, we are ready to start after a little bit more calibration to start getting data in. So what are we going to do with the light that's coming in from these objects? Well, because it was going to be such an audacious mission, because it's going so far away from the earth that we're not gonna be able to repair it, we needed to pack it full with as much science as we could. And as a result, there are four instruments on the Webb telescope. We've got NearSpec, which is concentrating specifically on near-infrared spectrometry. We have NEARIS, which is uh, near-infrared both camera and spectro uh, spectroscopic abilities. We have NearCam and we have MIRI, the mid-infrared instrument. Now, each one of these instruments doesn't just do one thing. They're effectively Swiss army knives full of other sub instruments and other abilities that are going to allow them to get more data and to find out more things. MIRI, the mid infrared instrument, as the name suggests, is going to be looking in the mid infrared section of the infrared spectrum. And the other three are going to be looking in the near infrared. That's the light just outside of the visible spectrum. And so, as well as our main instruments, there are some components that are either special or pretty common to those four instruments on the Webb telescope. You can't send a telescope into space without having cameras. And obviously the cameras on the Webb telescope are a bit different to the ones that you have on your mobile phone or a digital camera because the type of light that we're looking at is different. NearCam, for example, has got 10 mercury cadmium telluride detector arrays. These are basically analogous, very, very similar to the CCDs, the charged couple devices that you would have in a digital camera, but they are made of a material and they are keyed specifically to working in the infrared. Of course, we don't just want to take pictures, we want to do science with the Webb telescope. And so we use spectrographs to do this. These spectrographs, uh, particularly the one on near spec, are going to analyze the spectrum of the light and the, well, specifically the infrared light that's coming from these distant objects. So just like you can use a prism to split visible light into the different colors, each color corresponding to a different wavelength of visible light, we can split infrared light into its different wavelengths as well. And those different wavelengths can tell us different things. 
They can tell us properties, including the temperature of the star or the galaxy that we're looking at, the mass. They can give us information about the chemical composition of dust clouds, gas clouds, and of planetary atmospheres. They can even give us information about the motion of that object. And it's important to note that the very most distant objects that we're going to be looking at with the Webb telescope, the very oldest objects in our universe, such as the first galaxies to form after the Big Bang, they are so faint that we're going to have to stare at them for hundreds of hours with the Webb telescope in order to be able to collect enough light to get the spectrum that we need to analyze. So Webb's got a lot of work to do. Then we've got coronagraphs. Now coronagraphs are important for any situation in which you're trying to image the area around a star. And so this is particularly important when we're looking at exoplanets. So what a coronagraph is, it's basically a special piece of optical opaque material or a, a device that is able to block out the light that is coming from the star itself and allow the telescope to just be taking in the light that is coming from around that disk. Otherwise, all the interesting stuff about exoplanets gets washed out by the light coming from the star. One thing that is completely unique to the Webb telescope is the micro shutter array. So NearSpec is equipped with the first ever micro shutter array to be uh, deployed on a telescope. And what this does is it allows us to focus on image and distinctly get data for about 100 or so individual objects in the same wild, wide field of view. So most space telescopes would need to pick a particular object to focus on and then move on to the next one and then move on to the next one. What Webb can do with this micro shutter array is it can individually image and get the spectral information for about 100 objects at the same time. And the way it does this is it has a special micro shutter array. So NearSpec is equipped with, you can almost imagine it as a series of 248,000 mini gates. Each one of those gates can be operated through a, a, magnet, a magnetic process to be opened or closed. So when you've got your initial image of the sky and you go, oh, OK, that galaxy is interesting. That one's interesting. That one's interesting. You can key the micro shutter array to open the gates to the areas that are interesting to make sure that you're just getting the light from those objects. And then you can start to analyze the spectrum from that. So it almost turns our web telescope into 100 mini telescopes on the same big platform. Once that light has passed through, it's sent to the spectrograph, which will split it into the different wavelengths of light. And then we can start to send that to our scientists who will analyze it to see what that's actually telling us. And as I mentioned, from that, we can get information about color, temperature, composition, motion, and even the mass of the objects that we're looking at. So what is the Webb telescope going to be investigating then? Well, Webb has got four main areas of research. Webb is going to be looking at something called first light and ionization of the universe, looking as far back in time as possible to the very earliest light that was emitted by the very, very first stars. It's going to be looking at some of the oldest galaxies in our universe. It's going to be looking at the birth of stars in nebulae, areas of dust and gas that usually obscure these processes. And it's going to be looking for and analysing exoplanets. And we will look in more detail at what it's going to do and how it's going to do that after our break. But I think now is a good time to take five minutes uh, to give our interpreter a, a little bit of a break and to give you a chance to go and grab yourself a drink. So in five minutes time, we will come back and we'll get into the science. Thank you, Sophie. Fantastic. And the recording is in progress, brilliant. So yes, yeah, so now we're going to look at the, the four main areas of scientific research that Webb's going to be doing, why it's going to be doing them, why we're interested in that, a little bit of the how of how they're going to do it, and then we're going to take a look at where it's doing this from. 
So let's look at the first topic first then, first light and ionization. Hopefully you're all familiar with the idea that astronomy is basically an art of time travel. Because light has a finite speed in space, uh, 300 million meters per second in the vacuum of space, that means that even though it's traveling incredibly fast, the fastest anything can in our universe, it's still going to take time to get from the source to us. Now, this image here is of Proxima Centauri, our closest star. That's 4.2 light years away. So the light from that star has taken 4.2 years to get to us. The further away in space you look, the longer the light has taken to get to you. So using telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to go back to around about 13.1, 13.2 billion years ago. That's a long way, but there's a couple of issues. The first thing is to be able to see even fainter light from the most distant objects, you do need a bigger telescope. The second is actually a problem that is a result of the Big Bang. Again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with but that's this idea of what we call cosmological redshift, the expansion of space-time as a result of the Big Bang. Everywhere we look in space, galaxies are moving away from us. I say everywhere, the Andromeda galaxy is actually moving towards us, but that's a localised phenomenon. When you look at really distant galaxies, they are moving away from us. Now, they're not physically moving through space, but space itself is expanding. And as a result, if you imagine the light traveling as a wave from these distant galaxies, and if you imagine that you've drawn that on a rubber band, and then you pull that rubber band to simulate that expansion of space and time, then what happens is the wavelength, the length of one full wave expands out, becomes longer. In essence, the light becomes more red. Now we've seen this with the Hubble Space Telescope. We've seen that the most distant galaxies appear visibly read to us in the images. The problem is that the very most distant objects have been shifted even out of the visible spectrum and into the infrared. Using optical telescopes, we have a physical limit on the distance or the amount of time back that we can look. Now, as it happens, we know that that's actually changing anyway. There is effectively an observational horizon. So we're, we're starting to lose the ability to see back as far as we could. But with the Webb telescope, because we're going to be looking in the infrared, this inflation effect that was caused by the Big Bang is that's caused the reddening of the light to go into the infrared. We're going to be able to see the very oldest stars and galaxies of our universe. We're going to be able to look at stars that emerged shortly after what we call the Dark Ages of the Big Bang. Now, what we mean by the Dark Ages is that after the, the Big Bang occurred, there was a huge amount of energy and there were lots and lots of individual particles that formed out of this energy, forming a kind of like a primordial, highly energetic soup. And a lot of that was what we call delocalized electrons, electrons that are not bound to a proton or a nucleus. And as a result, light that was scattering around wasn't actually able to travel anywhere. So there is a physical limit to how far back we are able to look. Now, as I said, Hubble has been able to get some images of these distant galaxies, but not far back enough to give us a really good understanding of the initial structure of the universe after the Big Bang. So Hubble is able, with its ultra deep field, was able to go back to about 480 million years after the Big Bang. The Webb telescope should be able to look back to around about 200 million years after the start of the Big Bang. And while in the grand scheme of the age of our universe, that might not sound like very much, given the acceleration and the rate of change of our universe in those early years, that's a phenomenally huge difference. We're going to get to see the very oldest objects. We're going to be able to see some of that first light that's been shifted into the infrared part of the spectrum. Now, one area that we're particularly interested in with the Webb telescope is a period of time called reionization. This occurred shortly after the first stars formed. 
So after the first stars formed, these stars were absolutely massive, around about 30 to 300 times the size of our own star, with incredibly short lifespans, um, huge amount of uh, luminosity, incredibly bright. They burnt out very quickly. They burnt out, ending in supernova. As a result, all of the energetic UV from those stars in the supernova was able to re-ionize the gases and the molecules in space. So it was able to strip electrons away. This is basically when we then started to get the first galaxies forming this region of time. And this is as far back as we're hoping we're going to be able to see with the Webb telescope. And that's important because understanding the formation of the first stars and the first galaxies what happens with any system is that first formation process acts as a template or what we call a nucleation site, a point around which things will start to gather. And so by looking back as far as we can, we start to get that first key of, well, what was that initial template for our universe? We can then compare that to current observation of more recent galaxies and stars, closer galaxies and stars to us, to really start to build our picture fully of what is the evolution of a general galaxy? What is the likely evolution of our universe? Can some of the information that we get from these images and from this data give us uh, some information to help in the dark energy mystery? This, the fact that potentially, you know, could this help explain what's causing the driving of the expansion of our universe? The other thing that's interesting is, during this process of reionization, we think that the earliest stars would have exploded as supernova. That's what our models suggest, that's what our thinking suggests, and this would have formed black holes to start to accrete material into those original galaxies. But until we actually image that time, or until we start to get that light, we can't be sure of that. So we're missing a big piece of our galactic uh, evolution puzzle, and that is hopefully what Web is going to be able to provide for us. Then the second um, thing, the birth of stars and uh, uh, the origin of stars. Uh, so stars are born in nebulae, regions of dust and gas in space. This is an image that the Hubble Space Telescope took of the pillars of creation. Now the problem with all of this dust and gas is that it's opaque to visible light. You can see in this image that we've got a couple of stars in the foreground over these gaseous pillow, uh, pillar structures. We can see the stars in the background, but we can't see the interesting stuff. We can't see the stars that are forming in this stellar nursery. And again, astronomy and space science and science in general, it's all about the understanding which allows us to make predictions. So we want to be able to understand star formation better. You know, in terms of the life cycle of our star, we've only been aware of our star for a click of a fingers compared to its entire lifespan. We've certainly not been able to see it evolve. But looking further out, we can look at these stars that are forming. Unfortunately, this pesky gas and, uh, gas and dust is getting in the way. Now, this is an image that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, but it's a near infrared image. And this is exactly the same structure the pillars of creation in the near infrared. And you can see that in the near infrared, that gas and that dust becomes almost transparent. The light from the stars inside, and you can see just how many there are, is able to shine through. And then using the Webb telescope, we can then start picking these out and analyzing these. Now this image is impressive enough, and we have to remember that the Hubble Space Telescope is primarily an optical telescope. It's designed to look in the visible part of the spectrum. The images that we expect to get with the Webb Telescope that has been specifically designed to look for this are going to unveil many more stars. They're going to start to unlock information about structures of the gases within space, and hopefully they are going to help revolutionize our understanding of the stellar life cycle, and potentially gain a better understanding of where our star might be going in its future as well. And it's quite nice. Uh, I've got quite a lot of toys that I get to play with as part of my job. And one of my favorite ones is my infrared camera that we bought specifically to talk about the web telescope. In this image here, you can see my colleague Natalie is inside a nebula. 
that nebula is a bin bag, okay? And in the visible part of the spectrum, visible light is not able to pass through it. However, in the infrared, if you look on the screen in the background, you can see that we can see through that bin bag and we can make out my colleague. Infrared being at a longer wavelength has different optical properties. In the same way that x-rays can pass through flesh, infrared can pass through dust and gas. And this allows us to unlock some of these secrets that are buried within these nebulae. The fourth, and for a lot of people, potentially the most uh, exciting research that Webb Telescope is going to be doing, is looking at what I like to call protoplanetary cocoons. So this is looking at the dust disks that form around young stars. Now, with the Webb Telescope being so large and having such good imaging capability, albeit in the infrared, and with its phenomenal spectroscopic capabilities, what it's going to be able to do is it's going to be allow, allow us to study stars as they form, to analyze the dust in these disk structures around those young stars, and to start to have a look at the uh, formation of planets within those disks. Perhaps more importantly, rather than actually seeing a planet form, what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to use spectroscopy to work out what elements are in that disk, to study organic molecules, to study the building blocks of a young solar system system, uh, and to see, you know, could the organics in a solar system, do they emerge from the disk itself? Are they brought from external sources? Where do they come from? These are all questions that Webb is going to help us to answer. And that extends to looking at all of the different sources of gas within our universe. So I've mentioned spectroscopy quite a lot. And I don't know if we've got any A-level physics students on the line. If we do, hopefully you've done this uh, relatively recently. Spectroscopy just means measuring stuff using the spectrum or the light coming from it. Now we can do this with a prism for visible light. We can split it into a spectrum. We can do it with the spectrometers on the Webb telescope. And what we're looking for in the case of the gas that is around these stars, that is potentially going to be where a solar system will form, is we're looking for bright, what we call emission lines. Now, in terms of infrared spectroscopy, it works a little bit different to visible spectro uh, spectroscopy. Spectral lines in the visible spectrum are caused by the excitation and de-excitation of electrons. Electrons, if they absorb enough energy, can be excited up to another energy level or two or three. And as they de-excite, as they transition from a higher energy level to a lower one, the way they do that is by emitting a little packet of light energy called a photon. Now, the energy of that photon is going to correlate to the energy level difference that that electron has dropped from. And each atom has a unique set of energy levels. Therefore, each spectrum, each set of these potential visible lines is unique to that atom. In the same way, infrared spectroscopy can be used to analyze molecules. And the way that that radiation is emitted is a little bit different. Molecules have got motion going on. There's a constant vibrational plane that is acting. And in fact, they can vibrate in different ways. They can vibrate side to side, upwards, downwards, they can twist. But all of these vibrations emit infrared radiation, and particularly strong in the near infrared. You can also get this happening through absorption and re-emission. So here is a carbon dioxide molecule. It can absorb incident infrared radiation, and then it can re-emit it. Now the frequency and therefore the wavelength of that emitted radiation is going to correspond to the time period and the mass of the molecules sub individual component atoms. And in the same way that you can for a visible spectrum, you can build up an infrared spectral fingerprint for molecules. And that's what Webb is going to be doing. It's basically taking a giant magnifying glass and a book with all of the possible infrared spectra for all of the different molecules. And it's going to allow us to identify what is out there. And then from that, we can start to build our models or complete our models 
or maybe even find some baffling information that's going to spark new questions. Here's an example of the kind of things that we're looking for. So on the left, we have a emission spectra, an infrared emission spectra that was taken from Comet Hale-Bopp. And we get these peaks, these high intensities at certain wavelengths that correspond to the vibrations for certain molecules. On the right, you can see the kind of uh, spectrographs that we're looking for. And these are the peaks that scientists are gonna be trying to pick out from the data for a lot of the different kind of silicates that we would be looking at when it comes to planetary formation. And you can see that each individual silicate molecule has its own unique peak at a, its own unique wavelength. This is what Webb is going to be doing. It's going to be scanning the skies, it's going to be focusing on the objects that particular scientists want to look at, and it's going to be fingerprinting them to allow us to find out more about them. This is particularly, oh, don't know what happened there, relevant to exoplanets. So exoplanets are just planets that exist outside of our own solar system. And one of the main things that Webb is going to be looking at is to study not just to find exoplanets, but specifically to study the atmospheres of exoplanets. Now, missions like the Kepler Space Telescope have identified thousands of exoplanets in our universe. Most of them are large on the large scale. We call them hot Jupiters because they are huge gas giants that are very close to their parent star that have orbital periods of, of just days. But what Webb's going to be able to do is give us unparalleled data about the atmosphere of exoplanets. It does this using predominantly something called the transit method. So what Webb's going to be doing is it will pick a region of space and it will look at stars, individual stars in that space, and it will look for characteristic dips in the intensity of the light coming from those stars. These dips indicate that a planet has passed in front of the star. And just to be sure, we check for a periodical approach to that. So we look for that dip and then we look to see if it passes again to make sure it's not something else that has passed in front. And once we've got these candidates, it's then going to use spectroscopy again to look at the spectral fingerprint of those gases. So this time we're not looking for a peak, an emission, we're looking for a trough. We're looking for where particular wavelengths of light have been absorbed. As the light from the parent star passes through the atmosphere of the planet, certain wavelengths are going to be absorbed by the molecules in the atmosphere. Now they will be re-radiated again. We saw that with the carbon dioxide, but they won't necessarily be re-radiated in the same direction. So the light comes towards the carbon molecule. It takes it in, the carbon dioxide absorbs that, re-emits that light, but re-emits it at an angle that is not going to get to our camera, to our imager, to our spectroscope. So we look for these characteristic dips at certain wavelengths. We go back to our little tome of all the different wavelengths and how they correspond to our particular molecules. And from that, we can start to pinpoint what molecules are in the atmosphere. We can look for organics, we can look for oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. We can even start looking for evidence of silicates. There are, there are some exoplanets that we believe have silicate rain occurring on them. We'd be able to see evidence of that. And again, these are the kind of dips that we're going to be looking for, characteristic absorption lines at particular wavelengths. So, it's not only looking out of our solar system that the Webb Telescope is going to be useful for. One of the things that I don't think has been particularly well publicised is the fact that Webb is also going to be getting images back towards our solar system. It's going to observe Mars and the giant planets, minor planets like Pluto and Eris. Uh, it's even going to be imaging and looking at asteroids in the asteroid belt, comets, Kuiper belt uh, objects. So it's also going to be looking back and applying these techniques back into our own solar system. In order to do all of this, being an infrared telescope and infrared effectively being heat, it needs to be very, very cold. It's a cryogenic telescope and it needs to be cooled down to about 220 degrees C. 
To do this, we do three things. We're sending it a long way away from the earth, we're shading the instruments from the sun, and we're actively cooling some of the instruments. So I've mentioned that it's gone to this L2 Lagrange point. This is a very special point in space that we've sent several missions to in the past. It's about one and a half million kilometers away from the Earth and it puts the Earth between the sun and the spacecraft. Now that's useful for a few reasons. It's useful because it means that we can use the Earth as a physical block of some of that infrared radiation that's coming from the sun. It's also useful because of this phenomena. If you look at the uh, time period of orbits of the planets in our solar system, you see that the further away from the sun you get, the longer that orbit is. That is, the further away from the sun you are, you start to lag behind something that's closer to the sun. Now, if we're putting the Earth between the sun and our spacecraft, then that means that our spacecraft is going to start to lag behind the Earth and eventually the Earth's going to stop protecting it. But at this special L2 Lagrange point, we have an interesting situation. So normally our spaceship is going to start to lag behind. At the L2 Lagrange point, they stay in step. The Earth stays constantly between the Sun and our spacecraft. The reason for this is, for anything to move in a circle, it has to experience a center acting or centripetal force. That centripetal force for objects orbiting within our solar system is provided by the Sun. But at that L2 Lagrangian point, that 1.5 uh, million kilometers away from the Earth, the Earth's gravitational pull is just right to give enough of a centripetal additional force to force our spacecraft to be staying at the same orbital time period. You can almost think of it as the Earth's providing a gravitational leash that's tugging the spacecraft along behind it. This is useful for a couple of reasons. It means that our spacecraft stays in constant line of sight with the Earth for communications, and it means that the Earth is constantly acting as a blocker for that infrared. Now, it's not just going to sit at the Lagrange point. It would be fairly unstable if it did that. It wouldn't take much to push it off course and have it start to lag behind. It's going to enter into what we call a halo orbit around that Lagrangian point. And the reason for that is if it's in a halo orbit going around that point, then it's got the component of attraction towards the center of the sun and a component of that is going to be acting towards the middle of that halo orbit. That means that if something tries to push it off course, it's basically naturally course correcting to stay in that point. Now, it will need to use some fuel to maintain that orbit, but it's not going to have to use anywhere near as much as we initially thought it would because the insertion into that orbit was so perfect. Well done to the uh, flight dynamic uh, analysts who worked out those calculations, by the way. Mwah, spot on. But of course, the radius of that orbit around the L2 point has been carefully calibrated to make sure that it still sits within what we call the umbral cone or the shade giving region that the Earth gives uh, to the um, spacecraft from the light coming from the sun. So you have to make sure you don't go outside of this cone, otherwise you're not getting any of that infrared blocking benefit. Last thing in the last couple of minutes that we're going to look at is how we keep it cool then. I mentioned the heat shield, five layers of multi-layer insulation. Each one reflects a lot of the infrared heat. Some is going to be absorbed and retransmitted to the next level, but that is then reflected out. A little bit of that is going to be able to get to the next layer, but that is then reflected out. And these five layers, and they, they've done a lot of work in uh, simulated space uh, environments to work out what the optimum number is, that means that very little heat actually makes it through to the telescope itself. In fact, the telescope will be around about 85 degrees C on the hot sun side, and it'll get down to minus 233 degrees C on the cooler shade side. Now that is sufficient for most of the instruments on board. 
But MIRI, the mid-infrared mid instrument, needs to be cooled down to, to seven Kelvin, just seven degrees above absolute zero. And I love MIRI because parts of it were built just down the road from me here at the University of Leicester. These carbon struts that you can see were built at the Space Research Centre. And MIRI itself is, uh, has, has a huge involvement in the UK. It was put together down at uh, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in Oxfordshire. Um, I got a chance to actually see it in the clean room there before it got shipped off to NASA Goddard to be integrated into the main spacecraft itself. Now, in order to get it down to just seven degrees above absolute zero, it's got an awesome piece of technology called a cryo cooler, which is basically a really advanced space fridge. It uses helium gas as a refrigerant. It's got a prime heat pump that has a pre-cooler that uses something called um, acoustic cooling. Don't ask me any questions on that one. I'm not entirely sure on the science behind that one, but I know it uses a process called acoustic cooling um, and a high efficiency pump that will pump this around the MIRI instrument, cooling it down so that it's able to see those incredibly faint thermal uh, signatures. If it didn't do that, if you didn't cool it down, then it would be analogous to trying to look out at the stars while surrounded by floodlights of visible light. If you don't cool your spacecraft down, if you don't cool the mirror and specifically the instruments down, we're not going to get to see those incredibly faint sources. And that's what we're looking for. The good thing with this process is much like your fridge, it's a sealed system. And unlike other infrared telescopes in the past, this means that we don't have to worry about losing uh, coolant, losing refrigerant. So it should mean that we get a really nice long operational lifespan for the mid-infrared instrument. So in summary then, and I've gone through a lot and it has been a whistle-stop tour of the, the Webb telescope, but Webb is, it, you can't say anything other than it's an audacious mission. To launch an origami unfurling space telescope the size of a tennis court with hundreds of potential single point failures that you're going to jet off to this point, 1.5 million kilometers from the surface of the Earth, that you're going to use a special gravitational balance point that also allows the Earth to act as a sun shield, and that you're going to look further back in time to look to the origins of the universe or give us the best information that we've had so far on the atmosphere of exoplanets. It's just an amazing mission. It genuinely is a marvel of engineering ingenuity. There are things on this telescope that had to be invented from the ground up to allow it to work and do what it needs to do. It's been phenomenally successful in its deployment, orbital insertion and telescope alignment. It could not have gone better. All of the pre-flight calculations have been spot on. We've had to do very little in the way of course correction. It's just been beautiful. And it's a classic space industry tale of tenacity, patience and perseverance. It was threatened with cancellation. There was delay after delay after delay. Scientists who thought they might be working on web data in 2011 have had to wait till 2021 for the launch to occur. But it's happened now. And very soon we're going to be getting the data from it. Those scientists are going to be looking at that data. And if you haven't guessed, yes, I am a little bit excited about this telescope. That is the end of my whistle stop tour of everything to do with the Webb telescope. Uh, a couple of links that might be of interest to you. The um, uh, STFC, Science and Technology Facilities Council, as part of UKRI, has set up a public engagement and education website. It includes information, videos and um, educational activities developed by a range of organisations. Some of the stuff I've developed is on there. Uh, I've also popped the National Space Academy link in there. And if you do do the social media thing, there are the socials for myself and the UK Space Academy. Disclaimer. I'm rubbish at so social media. I really don't post very much, but do check us out on UK Space Academy and maybe check in and say hello. And so if anybody does have any questions, I'd be very happy to tackle them to the best of my ability now. Oh, thank you, Sophie. That was absolutely fantastic. And uh, 
I thought I knew quite a bit about the Webb Telescope until I've just sat through that last hour and learned an awful lot more. So thank you ever so much for sharing your expertise on that. I think we've all learned something this evening. So I think if I've counted correctly, we've got about seven or eight questions. Um, oh, wow. Some of them I think, yeah, and, and it just goes to, to show you just how interested our audience is. So some of them I think you may have answered already, but I think this may be beneficial for those that perhaps are watching back on YouTube or potentially joined us a little way through. So I'm going to start with Raphael's question, which was... Um, um, are the Webb telescope mirrors yellow? And if so, what metals is it made out of and why? Yes, absolutely. So they are a yellowy goldy colour. And that's because you've got a beryllium understructure, but that beryllium understructure is coated with an incredibly thin layer of gold. It's coated with the gold because that gold is extremely reflective for infrared. So it's the very best possible surface for infrared to reflect from and not get scattered uh, and not, you know, develop interference effects and things like that. Fabulous. Thank you, Sophie. Brilliant. Uh, then I'm going to move on to a question from Richard. I think this is quite interesting. And I hope you've got the answer. Um, Richard asks, uh, please explain why the telescope could not have been deployed in a low Earth orbit before moving it to L2, where problems, if there were any in theory, could have been fixed by a manned mission. You are absolutely correct. And that is a really good question. The short answer is we would have loved to have been able to do that. Um, we that having to get everything to occur en route is a nightmare because, as you say, if something went wrong, we couldn't go to it. If it were in orbit, yes, we could deploy a crewed mission there. The problem is the optics on the web telescope are incredibly fragile and they're quite exposed. And we have a real issue in low Earth orbit with space debris. Uh, everything from, you know, large fragments bits of old sites way down to small microscopic fragments and bits about the size of a grain now the problem is when you're dealing with orbital velocities even something as small as a grain of sand has got the same kinetic energy as a shotgun bullet and so that means that if we had done this deployment in low earth orbit the risk of a micrometeorite, a piece of space debris, impacting any part of the spacecraft, and you saw the kind of tolerances that we're dealing with in these deployments, could have resulted in a catastrophic loss of either the whole mission or of one of the instruments. So unfortunately, it was, it was, our hand was forced by the space debris problem. And that's a really good question, because it, I think you know, we talk about space debris a lot. It is a, a topic that's coming up more and more in the media at the moment. And here we're seeing the effect of it. It directly impacted how the engineers and scientists had to go about deploying the Webb telescope. Fantastic. Thank you for that, Sophie. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, and that brings on really nicely to actually our next question, which was about the mirrors. So Penny's asked a number of questions and Penny, we will try and get to all of them as best we can. I am conscious of time. But the first one was, uh, are the mirror segments flat? I think you talked about this a little bit with the micro actuators. Um, are they segments flat or are they curved? So the deployed mirror is effectively a curved dish. Ah, yes. Very good question. They are ever so slightly concave so they're very slightly curved so that when we have the whole dish uh, being formed there is a slight curvature to it which will focus that light back onto the secondary mirror which is at the end of that big boom that you see sticking out from the mirror so yeah brilliant question there is a slight curvature to the web telescope mirrors brilliant and this is one for those uh scientists sat at home very quick question that um and bear with me let's just have a quick look who sent this one in um it is from matt and matt asks will the data from this particular project uh, be made available to the public or educational institutions so some of the data certainly will do the way that these telescope projects um work is um you get scientists who will submit grant applications for time on the telescope and they will be observing a particular thing. So they will maybe, you know, you're an exoplanet researcher who wants a particular number of days to look at this particular system to get information. Information like that won't necessarily be made available to the public or at least won't in, uh, immediately be made uh, available to the public. 
But there is going to be a repository of um, data from the Webb telescope that will be made available. And keep your eyes peeled because it's very likely that there will be some citizen science projects uh, emerging, um, which are going to utilize that data and allow armchair scientists or at-home scientists to take that data and do something interesting with it. Thank you, Sophie. I'm just thinking my own A-level physics students would love that. So yes, we will definitely keep uh, an eye out for those particular citizen science projects. Right, I'm going to try and couple some of these questions together because I am wary of time, but thank you everybody for sending them in. We will try and answer as many as we can. So Taylor is asked, and thank you for sending this in, Taylor. Um, would there be any galaxies that have been redshifted so much that they would be moved outside of even the infrared spectrum that Webb therefore wouldn't be able to see? That's a great question. Our current models and our current understanding, given when we believe the first galaxies were forming, um, show that they're going to stay within the infrared. So we don't think there'll be any galaxies uh, that have been shifted outside of the infrared. We certainly know that the radiation from first light, the first ever light emitted uh, in our universe, has been shifted so far out that it's in the microwave. We see this as cosmic microwave background radiation. But as far as we know, and as far as our mathematics uh, suggests, we're fairly certain that uh, galaxies that we're able to observe should all still fall within the infrared range. Fabulous. Well, it's exciting for the, for the web, definitely. Brilliant. Um, I'm going to couple two more questions together, if you don't mind, Sophie. And basically, they're along the lines of, um, essentially, what is powering the web telescope? So both Penny and David have asked, if the telescope is at sort of L, uh, position L2 and therefore in the umber of the Earth, surely solar panels would not be a great way of powering the telescope. So how do we power the telescope if it's at that L2 position? Well, believe it or not, it is powered by solar panels. So the Webb telescope does have a solar array. While it is in that umbral cone, which stops a lot of the light from being able to get to it, enough light does fall on the solar array to, uh, to provide power. It doesn't provide much power. Um, off the top of my head, I think, uh, yeah, it's about 2000 watts of power that is produced to run the entire telescope. That's everything from the onboard computer to, you know, internal temperature management to the actual instruments itself. Now, 2000 watts, that's what, about a kettle? So, you know, we're talking about uh, running this whole thing on the same power as a, as a kettle, because that's the most we can generate from its solar array. So as a result, we've had to come up with, you know, cycling programs that are going to minimise the energy draw. We're going to have to choose which instruments are running at a particular time. You certainly can't get the whole telescope chugging away constantly. We need to be topping up those batteries and keeping them going. So, yeah, very, a very good, uh, very good question. Once again, thank you for that wonderful answer, Sophie. Right, we're, we're going to stick with the final three. So people are still sending them in. I think that's fabulous, but I'm going to limit it to three more and hopefully we can get that in the next three or four minutes so we're not too late. Um, following on from that, uh, and just to show the diversity of the people attending this evening, Sophie, uh, Will, aged 14, and this is a lovely follow-up question, asks the following question. How do you make sure that the telescope remains in that correct orientation? So we know it's at the L2 point, but how does it physically maintain that position over the duration of the mission itself? Sorry, can you repeat that? You're breaking up just a little bit. Sorry, Sophie. Yeah, that's my terrible bandwidth. Uh, it was from Will, age 14. He was asking, how do you make sure that the telescope remains in the correct orientation for the duration of the mission? Oh, great question. Yeah, so obviously, while it is a gravitationally relatively stable force, uh, it does is going to have to do some active course correction to do this. Um, and so it has got small thrusters on board that are going to allow it to be able to correct its course. It doesn't need very much because we're talking about little tiny micro adjustments as it's orbiting. But that's ultimately is the limiting factor on the mission, because eventually the Webb telescope will run out of fuel to be able to make those course corrections and gradually it will move into an unstable orbit around that L2 Lagrangian point. That's why the thing that allowed us to go from a maybe 10 years to a oh, maybe 20 years was the fact that because we had such 
a perfect orbital insertion. We had to use very little of the fuel to make course adjustments en route, allowing the Webb telescope to maintain more of that fuel to use for L2 uh, corrections around the uh, Lagrange point. Another great question. Yeah, you, welcome to the Keel Physics Centre, Sophie. We did get some excellent questions. Um, right, two final questions then. The first one's from Matt, which is quite a technical one, so I don't know if you'll know it, but I'm sure you may be able to point him in the right direction. Uh, Matt asks, with regards to the reflective surface, does it require a surface coating similar to Mylar uh, to reduce unwanted reflections? And if so, um, how was the correct coating decided upon? That's interesting and you are correct. I wouldn't be able to answer that uh, with a definite answer. Um, my instinct is that because we're reflecting infrared light, um, you'd want to be, that we're using the gold because it's the perfect surface for reflecting infrared light. As soon as you introduce another covering onto that, you're introducing another material that maybe doesn't have the same uh, reflective ability. So my instinct would be to say that it probably isn't. I would want to double check that though, uh, rather than saying that that is a definite answer. Yeah, no problem at all. Thank you for that, Sophie. I'm going to mix two. So I keep saying we've got a final question. I will limit this to the very final two. So I'm going to stick two questions together from Graham and Penny, and I'm going to end up with a nice one, I think, for your from your perspective, Sophie, to sort of nicely bring it all back together. So Graham firstly asks, um, have we had any results to date? And Penny takes that a step further by saying, I'm assuming there's going to be an enormous amount of data. How long will it take the scientists? He's actually put how many decades will it take? to go through all the data that we then receive from this mission? Yeah, two really good questions there. Um, I'll tackle the uh, first one first. So we, we've had done the al alignment, we've seen those first initial images. We're now going through a process of taking test data for the individual instruments to gather that through. So we are starting to get some data, but it's not particularly specific because it's uh, going through this calibration process. In terms of how long this data is going to take to be analysed, you're absolutely right. We are looking at decades worth of data. Um, obviously, I mentioned that, you know, particular scientists will apply for time on the telescope to look at particular objects. That will then give them uh, information and data that they will be analysing for months or even years just on their own projects. And then they won't even use all of that data that comes through. If you're using, for example, near spec and you're wanting to uh, look at the spectrographic information that comes through, your research is going to look at one particular area of that and you will have a huge amount of other data that's come through with that. And what's been happening a lot recently, particularly with Hubble data, Chandra data, and even data that was sent from uh, missions like Kepler, is scientists go back to that data at a later date if they're looking for something else, they'll go, well, maybe Hubble picked up something on this 20 years ago. Let's do a deep dive back into that data. So it's not unusual for 20 or even 30, 35 year old data to be used. I suspect if this mission goes for the full 20 years, I suspect that we will be analysing and using data from this for at least 50. It, it's, it's super exciting. That really is. I'm, I'm just thinking of my own students I'm teaching now that potentially got a whole career analysing mm. some of this data, Sophie, which is just fabulous. And on that note, I'm, I'm going to ask you one final question, um, which often gets asked about a lot of astrophysics projects, particularly at a time it, as we currently find ourselves in with, you know, finances being stretched and there being lots of other tugs on time. And I think it's a great question from Luke, which is, uh, to what extent would you say that the Webb telescope currently justifies its cost? So I think you mentioned, was it about eight billion? Um, Over eight dollars? billion in total, absolutely. Yeah. And this is always, and I'm glad that you've asked this question because there's, I would love to be able to say, of course it does, but you know, there are other considerations to make you know, and it is a question that I get asked a lot of the time. In order to justify the money that gets spent on these kind of projects, you have to look at the big picture, not just in terms of the science output and this quest for knowledge and quest for understanding of the universe and the world around us, but also in terms of the fact that these are not just telescopes, these are projects. So yes, it's going to cost potentially in the long run over $8 billion. 
But a lot of that money will have gone on the wages of the engineers, the designers, the scientists, the testers, and even, you know, towards things like salaries of the accountants and the HR departments. And, you know, all of these missions, the costs that go towards it are paying for the services that build the object. So that's that's the first thing is. That eight million has not been spent just on that telescope. That eight, eight billion, you know, it's the running costs and things like that. Well, those running costs are mostly staff, you know, or buying products. So it's not as if we're just going, yes, we're throwing this money out there at it. The other thing is that, yes, eight billion over the lifespan of this is a lot, but you know, it's taken us 15 years to get to this point. We're hoping to get 20 years of data out of this. So that money is going to be split up over nearly 40 years worth of, of science and engineering. That in turn makes it quite a negligible amount of money when you consider it in comparison to other things that we spend ridiculous amounts of money on that, and I'm going to be very careful not to mention anything in particular, but there are things money gets spent on that definitely do not give us the same kind of inspiration, knowledge, information and education that the web telescope is going to give us. And then the third point is we as a species are inquisitive. We are driven. The success of our species has been driven by asking questions, seeking the answers to those questions, asking more questions as a result of the information that we found from that. What we end up getting when we have these kind of big missions is not just more puzzle pieces to our understanding of, of the universe, but we develop new technologies. You know, the technology that is being used here to make these infrared imaging devices and these infrared spectrographs is going to trickle down into industry. The CCDs that we have on our mobile phones they have been enhanced and improved no end by space imaging. And so you do get this trickle down effect occurring as well. So it is a difficult one because, yes, it's a lot of money, but that money is going back into businesses. It's going back into educational establishments. It's going on salaries. It's giving us knowledge. It's giving us a sense of awe and wonder. And ultimately the technology involved is likely to trickle down and be used again so from my point of view i do think that as long as these missions do what they set out to do and take the approach of the web telescope of all right this is going to be expensive so we're going to make it do as much as we can as long as it's following those criteria from my point of view it's absolutely worth it Fabulous, Sophie. If I if you were in our Keel uh, lecture theatre room, I'd be stood up there clapping. I fully agree with everything you've just said there. As a fellow scientist, I think that not not just that thirst for knowledge, but I think you're absolutely right. We've still got seventy people here this evening, literally listening to every word you're saying. So that you're absolutely right. As a species, we we need to satisfy that curiosity. But it's more than that. It's jobs. It's livelihoods. It's that expansion of business and enterprise. I think you're absolutely right. So on that note, I want to say a warm thank you for spending an hour and a half of your time this evening in front of the Keel Physics Centre, Sophie. It's been fabulous. I wish you all the very best with your uh, next endeavours, with crunching through the day. I'm sure we'll get you back in a few years and you can update us on some of the uh, the findings that you've got from from web um, but yes, just for those that are attending, that. thank you Sophie just for those that are interested we have one final talk left in our Keel uh, evening talk series and that is due to be given on the 5th of April now for our traditional followers that is not a Thursday that is a Tuesday and that's because the speaker who is Tommy Isaac, uh, can only join us on a Tuesday. Uh, but actually, from a Keel perspective, it's a fabulous way to end because he's going to come and talk to us about the High Deploy project. Uh, and Keel as an institution is part of that as a smart energy network demonstrator. So the topic of that uh, particular talk is introducing hydrogen gas into the UK gas grid. It's taking place on Tuesday, the 5th of April. Um, and the links will all be sent around following today's um, completion of this particular talk. One final thing before we go, I hope you have a wonderful evening and you may have noticed it in the chat box, Sharon, who's our IOP colleague, will be placing um, a feedback link so you will receive that. That's particularly useful for Mike and myself who run the centre because we're also after what you want to hear. 
So if there's a particular topic that you really would like to hear more about next year, uh, please let us know and we will do our very best to find a speaker to cover that topic. So with no further ado, I wish you all a very lovely evening and I look forward to seeing you all again on the 5th of April. Bye for now.